Hello, and welcome to Fresh Blood, a podcast about killing it after 40, where we prove that new blood does not necessarily equal young blood. Here to discuss what it takes to have continued success through life, I'll be your host, Jolie Downs. With over 20 years of executive recruiting experience, I've learned how much we can grow and be inspired by other people's stories. I'm excited to share that with you here on Fresh Blood. Today, we are talking with Jennifer Ann Gordon. Jennifer has made her living as an actress, a magician's assistant, a gallerina, a comic book dealer, a painter, and burlesque performer before becoming an award-winning horror fiction novelist and an award-winning professional ballroom dancer, performer, instructor, and choreographer. Jennifer has also had her mixed media artwork published entitled Victoriana, Mixed Media Art of Jennifer Gordon, and she is the creator of Vox Vomitus, a video podcast on the Global Authors on the Air Network, as well as a co-host of the podcast Writers Showcase. I am so excited to learn more. Jennifer, welcome to Fresh Blood. Could you tell us a bit more about your journey to getting where you are today? Hey, thank you so much for having me. So yeah, my name is Jennifer Ann Gordon. I am a native of New Hampshire in the United States, and I have always been more on the artistic side of things. I don't do math or science very well, so I had to figure out a way to make my living in the arts. Mm -hmm. I went to school for theater, and after that I worked in an art gallery, and then I moved to the Midwest, and I wrote an independent comic book, and I owned a comic Mm -hmm. book store for a little while, and then I concentrated for a really long time on visual art. Mm -hmm. And then on a whim, I decided to take a ballroom dance class. And I was in my early 30s when that happened. And I fell in love with ballroom dancing. And I ended up becoming a professional ballroom dancer and and an instructor at an old age in the business, in the dance business. It was very weird to have somebody like start in the business in their 30s. Yeah, yeah. I've been a ballroom dancer for since 2010 professionally. COVID kind of derailed that a bit. The dance studio I worked at ended up shutting down. So I had to really pivot my career in the last year and a half. But I am also a novelist. So it gave me time to concentrate on my writing and figure out uh, what to do next because I didn't have a backup plan. And my husband is my dance partner and he didn't have a backup plan. So COVID hit and we went, oh, we don't have a job anymore. What did you do? How did you pivot? How did you deal with this past year and a half? A lot of panic. (laughs) A lot of panic. (laughs) Yeah. Just like pure panic most of the time, stress eating. But I will say being a ballroom dance instructor, I have met the best people I could possibly meet in my life. I have students in all different walks of life, all different careers. And one of my now former dance students, was opening up a political advocacy boutique firm. And he knew that, A, I needed a job, and he knew that I was passionate about social justice and things like that. On a lark, he offered me a job kind of training to be a political advocate, which is a a nice way to say lobbyist, Mm because lobbyists have such a bad connotation to that word. But what Mm -hmm. we do is political advocacy for groups like the National Association of Social Workers and the Psychologist Association and things like that. Oh, I love it. And how has that been pivoted to that? That's That's a big pivot. It's a huge pivot. It's a huge pivot. Um, And again, it was a strange time to all of a sudden get into politics in this peripheral way. Yeah. Yeah. And everything was virtual because of COVID. So it was, it's just been a really weird year. And I've just learned a lot. Some things I wish I could unlearn about the way (laughs) the world works in reality. Um, But yeah, it's been a learning experience. It's been great. I'm glad that the, the state house is not in session during the summer because it, it's nice to have the summer off because my brain was a little, <gasps> so much is happening. 
Oh, so much has happened. I feel you. I'm right there with you. <laughs> it's just, it's a, it's a really weird time in history. That's for sure. And it, it's like a tender hook because it's such a weird time in history. Just Exactly. Stop. I know. And if you don't know like how to even plan things at this point, because I'm obviously, I'm also a writer and I'm on a committee for a literary conference that's supposed to take place in person in November and it's been very weird to like contact people to get them to be at this literary conference because so many people are still like, I don't know what it's going to be like in November. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know what the mm-hmm. world is even going to look like. <laughs> I'm curious, it's such a switch from ballroom dancer to lobbyist type of role. I, now, there's a lot of people who have had to do a big switch over this past year. There's so much has been shaken up and and some are going to be going back into the industry. Some are finding new industries. Is there anything that you've learned during this the switch that you've gone through that has helped you successfully make this change that you think might help other people? Um, you know, honestly, ballroom dancing and being a ballroom dance instructor or being a teacher of any kind. I've, and especially because mm-hmm. I, I taught adults who were learning to do something that they obviously didn't know how to do. A lot of them were scared and nervous and awkward when they first start dancing. So my job as a ballroom dance teacher, I feel like the dancing always came second. My first job was to make a friend with my mm-hmm. students and get to know them get to know why they are there, like the real reason why they have decided at the age of 60 to learn how to dance. Mm -hmm. And I feel like for me, political advocacy, and one of the reasons why I was offered this job, so much of it is about building relationships and communicating with people. And my student, who's now my boss, knew that I was good at connecting with people. So I would say for everybody who's had to make a huge change in the past year and a half, I would say try to find the very small similarities between what you did and who you were pre-COVID and what you're doing and who you are now, because it might seem like it's a completely different world and you're doing something completely different, but there's a hint of who you are in your past career in whatever you're doing now, whether you're now working from home and you get to sit in your PJs all day and you are on zoom for 11 hours straight, (laughs) or it's, (laughs) there's probably something similar there and just hold on to that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when you were talking about what you were doing as a an instructor for ballroom dance and how you're interacting with your clients. In my head, I was thinking, oh gosh, that's perfect. That's perfect for what she's doing right now. It's exactly. Yeah. It's, it's really the exact, like, it's the same thing in a weird yes. way. It's the same yeah, exact really thing, is. except in, instead of teaching people a box step, I'm just trying to communicate with them about state and local issues. Exactly. Exactly. So that's great. I'm curious, out of all the things you've done, because you've done some really interesting things, what do you feel has been one or two of your greatest successes and what did you learn from it? I think personally, gosh, this is hard to say because I feel like in any job I've had, I've found some great successes, even Mm -hmm. though like on the outside, it might not seem like that. I will say Um, winning the Kindle Award for Best Horror and Suspense Novel of 2020 for my debut novel, Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent, was a huge thing for me because that book, I always joke that people say, oh, you wrote it so fast. You wrote it in just like three months. But I always say it took 20 years of living in my head and then three months of writing it. So it was such a labor of love that, and, and it's such a strange and surreal and dark and sad story that having it be recognized as a best of anything was just absolutely lovely and a a really good highlight of 2020. (laughs) Oh, and that was your debut novel. Yes. That's incredible. Congratulations. And and you've already written two other books since then, correct? Yes. Yes, I have. I wrote a two book series called The Hotel that includes the books From Daylight to Madness and When the Sleeping Dead Still Talk. Those are both very short novels that I originally thought was going to be one really big book, but then I released them separately because I couldn't figure out how to market it as one giant story (laughs) and not give away spoilers. (laughs) So it's easier if I just do it as two books. (laughs) 
<laughs> now, was it easier for you to write these books after you got the first one out of you? Yes and no. I think writing in general during the past year and a half and during the pandemic has been, people would think it would be easier because you're in your house and you have all this time, but there's, it's been hard, harder to write within the last six months, especially when I think everybody has like pandemic fatigue and there's just still this like lingering, are things back to normal? Are they not back to normal? I'll say each book gets easier to write on a technical level. Like the craft is easier. And I understand like things that I just didn't understand when I wrote my first novel, how to pace something or how to just like things like that you learn along the way when people read it, and, mm -hmm. like your beta readers read something and this, is, this part's really boring. Like you've got to do something like dialogue, anything. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I'm curious. I was yeah, just thinking was, about this because as you were saying, we're, things are changing, things are opening up. Are you planning on going back to your ballroom dancing or do you feel really good about where you're going and moving forward with, with the political aspect? So I think for right now, I'm teaching a little bit. Like we, my husband and I teach one day a week. We have a small handful of students. We're not opposed to teaching more, but again, it's such a strange time and I, I have health problems. We, my husband and I take care of my elderly mother. She lives with us. So we've had to be very careful this year. And for me personally, like teaching ballroom dance is so physical and you're, so, you're really in somebody's space. There is no social distancing. We're mm -hmm. dancing with people we don't know. You're six inches away from them. So it's very difficult in a, in an environment where some people might be vaccinated. Some people don't believe in vaccines. Some people don't believe in masks. And yeah. in our state where I live in New Hampshire, a business can't ask a person if they're vaccinated. Like that's illegal. Oh, wow. So it's, it's a, it would be a strange time for mm -hmm. us to open a ballroom dance studio because we would want to be catering to people who are vaccinated or who would wear a mask, but it's just, it would be too tricky to I'm say shocked. like You're, you can't even ask. You're not allowed to ask. Yes, not allowed to ask. Not allowed shocked. To ask. I, I'm in California, so I'm in the opposite type of a situation. <laughs> yeah, it's very dialed in. Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have one of my, the co-host on my podcast, Allison Martine, fellow author. She's also in California. So sometimes like she and I compare like notes on what's going mm -hmm. on. Are you allowed to go places yet? Are people wearing yeah. masks? I feel like New Hampshire has gone, our, our state motto is live free or die. So the second <laughs> somebody whispered <laughs> into the universe that the pandemic's over, Everyone was just like throwing their masks on the floor. And they're like, and and it's done. We can just. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, that's not how this works. Yeah, no. I went to Georgia and I was like, wait, wait, isn't there a pandemic happening? I don't. Understand. It wasn't happening there because I was like, that's too. It's funny. a completely different world in California. It was fascinating. It was fascinating. So. Um, so I'm curious now, what about the flip side? What about a big challenge that you had, a big obstacle you had to deal with or a big mistake? And what did you learn from it? Oh, you know, obstacles and mistakes. I think I had a, I struggled a lot owning the comic book store. I owned it with my now ex-husband, but oh. that I just wasn't cut out to be that type of business owner. I don't think like mm -hmm. owning a store, though I loved com, like I, I was passionate about comics. It was just it was a very grueling schedule. Like when, when you own your own business, it owns, you're there yeah. seven days a week. And at the end of the year, when you do taxes and you realize you've made like three cents an hour, it's a little demoralizing because you're just mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh. So that was hard. And our shop did well, but it never did so well that we weren't constantly petrified of losing it. Mm -hmm. So that was like three years, four years of just like constant back of my mind stress. So that was hard. Also, yeah, I think that was probably like the hardest job obstacle that what did I had control feel? over. Did you sell the company when you got divorced? Did the we ended up, yeah, so I was doing uh, artwork on the side. I was doing my mixed media 
art on the side and I was selling it on Etsy and I would have to get up really early in the morning in order to still be able to paint and package orders. And it just became obvious that my heart was there. And my husband at the time was already working a day job someplace else because we just couldn't both survive on just the comic shop alone. So I was working at the comic shop and it was taking time away from artwork. And I ended up being very successful on Etsy once we sold the comic shop and I was able to focus just on artwork for a long time. Such an important lesson to learning what you, what isn't right for you is just as important because we get into things and, and so many people will stay in something that isn't right for them. And it's amazing what happens. I had a situation myself where I was helping in a family business and it just was not happy. And once that was let go and that opened up all this time to actually focus on the things I wanted to be doing, what a change in life. What an amazing, wonderful change in life. So I feel like if people were strong enough to realize that little moment that you just said, I wasn't happy and Mm -hmm. be strong enough to just, if we all did it, like that's when you make a change. But I think we just spend a lot of time being unhappy and just thinking because we're grown ups, you know, that this is what life is. You do something and if you're happy, that's great. But happiness is a bonus and it shouldn't be a bonus. It should be. Mm Just like Mm -hmm. what we have in life, we should be allowed to be happy. I agree. Life should be about joy. That is what it's about for me. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of things. A lot of things. I that that comes off slight, but that's a lot of things. But joy is very important to continuously bring into your life. So, now, what do you think? What do you think is key to having continued success through life? Oh, again, I'm going to go back to the happiness thing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like for me, because I'm an artist, I'm a creative type, I feel like success is always being able to create something Mm -hmm. new. And it's whether that's a a dance or Mm -hmm. a book or a painting or just an experience for somebody else. As a dance teacher, I would create memories for my students. So I just creating something because if you create something like it lasts it's what makes you immortal almost things Mm -hmm. last forever somewhere whether it's Mm -hmm. a story that one of my dance students will tell to their kids and then their kids will tell to their kids like oh do you remember grandma and grandpa they were so beautiful at the tango like it becomes like family stories and I and the part I had in that creating that for other people is just as important as painting. Yes, you know? I love that answer. It's beautiful. Yes, I completely agree too. Is there something that you've learned throughout all the things that you've done that has brought you the most benefit in your life that you think could benefit others? It's just going to sound so, I don't want to sound like overly like new agey and overly happiness thing, but I've learned to forgive myself when I make mistakes and I've yeah. learned to stop self-censoring. Like for many years, I think I was telling myself, I can't write a novel. I don't know how. I can't do it. I'm not equipped to it. I'd have to go back to school. And then if I went back to school, would teach me how to do it because I can't do it. Mm -hmm. And I got very sick of telling myself I couldn't do things before I even tried but I, again, I feel like sometimes like life beats you down over the years. And then like you get to this point where all of a sudden you have no self-confidence anymore. Mm-hmm. And I kind of got to that point before I started ballroom dancing and ballroom dance brought me back to who I was supposed to be. And that was this like the, the long journey to becoming myself. Yeah, no, this is important because that's what you said right there is so true. Life does beat you down and it beats out for so many people and it beats out the confidence. And there's countless people sitting in that feeling right now. So what about through your tough times? What did you do to push through your tough times? Ballroom dance was what one of the major things that got me through my tough times. So I was in like a bad place mentally, like for a while. Doing art was great and I loved it, but it was isolating. And I was in a relationship with my ex-husband that wasn't healthy. 
at all. And I, I ended up becoming like very agoraphobic, almost mm. like I didn't even want to leave my house. I'd have a mm. panic attack if I went to the mailbox. Um, but there was a ballroom dance studio a block from my house and I had wanted to take lessons, ballroom dance lessons my whole life. Like I just wanted it so badly and a long time for me to build up the courage to actually walk through that into that dance studio and How change my that? life. Cause that's a big deal. You just said you wanted it your whole life and you never did. Yeah. That's the thing. I think about that with a lot of people, what there's these longings that people never do. What was that catalyst? How did you cross the threshold? In that? The irony is my now ex-husband for our first wedding anniversary got me or slash us a gift certificate to learn how to ballroom dance. Okay. And I, I was so thrilled. But then he very quickly said, this isn't something I want to do at all. And I was like, oh, so I'd be going by myself. And I, I just, it felt so weird. And mm-hmm. I would stare at that gift certificate and just like long for it so badly. And I had that gift certificate for over a year. I think it was probably about a year and four months. And then the dance studio started calling me and saying, we noticed you never used your gift certificate. Can we schedule a lesson? And I ignored those phone calls for weeks just because I was too petrified. And finally, one day I just picked up the phone when they called and I scheduled a lesson. And I think I lost five pounds that week, the week before my first lesson, because I was so petrified. Oh, wow. And, And it was just like, so it seemed so scary to me. I didn't know if I was that person that could learn to dance anymore, even though once upon a time I had been on stage as my job, I just like forgot that part of me. I finally got that courage, went to the ballroom dance studio, and that is where I met my now husband. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> you know, he was my dance partner for years and we were best friends. And then everybody kept saying, I don't understand why you two aren't dating. And this is after I broke up with my husband and stuff like that. And we were like, oh, we're just friends. And they're like, it seems like you're more than friends. And we're just like, well, no, we're just friends. And then uh, we obviously weren't just friends. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like we were, it took like everybody else saying, you're in love with each other. You don't want to admit it when you're such good friends sometimes. You don't want to ruin that. Yeah, so. exactly. Mm-hmm. But but yeah. the great thing is because we were such good friends, like we didn't hide things from each other. We didn't have that, like, oh, we're dating. So I'm just going to mm-hmm. show you the good parts of my personality. <laughs> <laughs> You got like the true. We knew, yeah, like we knew all the bad stuff and the great stuff <laughs> going into this. That's awesome. <laughs> so I'm curious, have, how do you have any regrets in life that that you've learned from that might be worth sharing? Yeah, I'll say I regret staying in an abusive relationship as long as I did. Yeah. Mm. That's I regret not having the strength to walk out the door when I very clearly should. So I, what helped me get out was I got assaulted really terribly. And, and my, uh, the person I was with, my now ex-husband was arrested and that was it. I was like, Oh, I actually can like physically leave because he's in jail right now. And, and it was only for a couple days, but it gave me like the, the time to, pack what I needed to pack and find a safe place to, to move and get a restraining order. And, but I wish like, I, like my regret is I wish I could have gotten out before almost getting killed. Like it was just like, I should have had the strength, but it's so hard when you're in the middle of it, you just can't get out of it. It's like quicksand. Yeah, no, that is so hard. Is there anything that you would tell someone who might be in that position right now? that they'll always do it again. You have to love yourself more than you love them. And I don't know. It's just, I don't want to be preachy to people because yeah. I hated it when, because I had friends who knew what was going on with me and they were just like, it's not normal. What's your relationship is not normal. It's not healthy. And I was like, I'm fine. When like no, clearly, 
Yeah. It's so <laughs> yeah. hard. It's so yeah. hard. I sometimes like what I want to tell people is if you just need somebody to talk, email me. <laughs> my emails on my website, like strangers, I don't care. You can tell me. <laughs> sometimes that's, that's, I just oh. need like somebody to hear it. Yeah. That's a wonderful offer too. It's it's a hundred percent true. And sometimes you need someone who's not close to your situation to talk to. Exactly. Oh. And somebody who's on the other side of it, because it's tricky to get out of situations like that. It's tricky to keep restraining orders going. It's tricky to oh, have yeah. to go to court and beg a judge to let you be safe. It's just oh, yeah. all of these things that we shouldn't have to do. No, it's horrendous. It's horrendous, really? but it's but it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. F- yes. Speaking you know, of- I just, I, I, I know, that I, I understand that it is incredibly hard when I can't fathom what it's like in that situation or how, how to deal with it. So I give you big props for, for making that change, even when he was in, in, in jailed for a couple of days, actually getting yourself out and making that change. So I yeah. you. thank you. So now are there any habits that you've developed through the years that you feel have helped you be successful in the different avenues that you've been working in? I don't know if it's a habit as much as it, as it is like a burning drive to not fail. Oh, yeah. And I think, so the habit is you've got to do it. You've got to put in the work, even if it's like, for me, I'm a creative type and people think, oh, you're an author. Oh, you're this. That must be so relaxing. That must be, you just do it whatever you want. But I treat it as a job. Like I have hours that I work every day and my friends will be like, oh, come on, hang out. Let's go to the lake. Let's do this. And I'm like, no, I, like, I have to work on my book. It is a job. It's creative and I love it. But like just taking it seriously mm-hmm. and Very knowing true. when I'll say it like and knowing when to like farm something out to somebody who's better at certain skill sets than you are. Like this is why I hired a publicist. This is like my publicist, Mickey. He is good at finding opportunities for me and that takes something off my plate. So Mm -hmm. I I would say, especially if you're like an entrepreneur type and you do things like mostly on your own, there's no such thing as just being completely on your own. Everybody needs a team. So a good habit to have is find your team. (laughs) Yes. Stack that team. It's a good advice. Exactly. And we try to do too much on our own. Yeah. So much. Because you think that's what you do. Oh, this is my business. I'll do everything. And sometimes you're doing yourself a disservice because you need to know what your strengths are and what, because we're not all 100% strengths. We all have weaknesses. And And a lot of times our strengths are our weaknesses. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That makes sense. That is true. (laughs) <laughs> that is very true to say, because I'm a creative person. I'm like, yep, my strengths are I'm very creative. I'm very artistic. I'm I'm talented. What are my weaknesses? I'm just that I'm only those things. Like I'm only creative. <laughs> I can't like balance a checkbook or <laughs> don't make me know, do physics. <laughs> don't. Yeah. Don't make me math. I don't. I even just like fractions hurt my brain when oh, I'm just like, please, no. when I'm like doing a recipe and it's just add two cups of this and two. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what is all of that together? <laughs> oh gosh. The fraction math. When my kids brought that from school, I was like, oh, let's look up some YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, it, I still have like math nightmares. <laughs> and and it's been a long time since I've taken a math class. Isn't like, it beautiful that you don't have to, right? I know. <laughs> that exactly. math teacher, I'm getting along just fine. I know. I never needed to learn algebra. <laughs> yeah, I should learn algebra. Never- math is very important. <laughs> that is very important. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I, I really haven't used any of the algebra so much. Yeah. <laughs> Although maybe I have and I don't realize it. I don't know. You must. Simple math. You should know simple math. <laughs> oh, you must know simple math. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I would think that math, it is, we all need to know our math. It's very important. Yes. But it's some of the higher level that I haven't quite used. Yeah, in, uh, exactly. And I'm like, oh, that's fine. School, like high school is really, and even college, it's really just, I think, showing kids and showing people like, all sorts of different things to figure out what they like. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because maybe they won't love math, but maybe, but some people do. Yeah. Or they don't like algebra, but they love geometry. Geometry. Yeah. 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 I've known those people. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But you're so right. Look at, look at what happened with you with the ballroom dance. It's, we need to be exposed to a lot of different things. And the fact is most of the people don't know what they really want, especially at a young age. It's a very small percentage of people at a young age who really know what they want to go after. And so you need to be those to all those different things. And really not only at a young age, even in your forties, 56, we need to be exposed to different things because we're constantly changing. We're constantly evolving. And you never know when that thing might come along that just lights you up that you had no idea, like your ballroom dance in your thirties. Yes. Yes. Cause yeah, I never, like in my wildest dreams when I was like 30, I never would have thought, Oh, I'm going to become a professional ballroom dancer. Like I never would have thought that, but then at 32, 34, 35, and that's what I was doing. It was just strange, but amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Life is really amazing that way. So now is there any, I don't know if you've ever had to struggle in getting a new job or, or finding that right next role when you made a transition, but is there any advice that you'd give someone in the 40 plus category who, who might be in that kind of position? Oh, I would say, I don't want to say go back to school, but if you're at a point in your life and you're in your forties or fifties even, and you have to make a drastic career change. I would say, think about the things that you always wish you had done and figure out if it's possible to do those things. Because you talk to so many people who say, or let's say they're computer programmers and then they lose their job and over talking to them, you hear them say, what I've always wanted to do was have a coffee roasting business. And that's well, <laughs> well, why don't you, you could try. Like, <laughs> So keep options open and don't be afraid to have to learn new things because we're going to, we all have to. When we went to school, it was a while ago. (laughs) Yes, exactly. So Jennifer, have you ever experienced ageism in any of your industries? Yeah. It's weird because I started ballroom dancing late, quote unquote, late in life. I was in my thirties, which starting in a, a dance career in your thirties is you almost have one foot in the grave is how they made me feel a little bit boss at the time she hired me, but we would end up having these staff meetings almost every day where she kept saying things like, I need to hire a a young and pretty female instructor because yeah, as if I was like this old ugly hag at the age of 33 and, and I would just get so upset and I was like, I would cry in the bathroom and every day, same thing. We need to hire somebody young and pretty, young and pretty. Jennifer's fine. She can make people laugh, but we need somebody that a man would be willing to rob a bank for. I remember she she said that once. And so out of like pure spite on my part, I just was so determined to succeed at that business that I did everything I could to become a really good instructor. And within six months, I was in like the top 15 female instructors for the country at like signing up new students. So it was like a very specific category, but I worked for a large ballroom dance franchise and it. So it was out of 120 studios and I became like in the top 15 teachers and I would win teaching awards every year. That's amazing. But she never stopped saying that we need (sighs) to find somebody pretty (laughs) and young. And showing that it does not matter what other people say. Does not matter what other people. Doesn't say. matter. Doesn't matter. Nope. Mm-hmm. They don't know. They don't know what you can do. They don't know what you are capable of. So perfect. This is really random, but it's just a little thought in the back of my head. I was curious. The magician's assistant. <laughs> how, did, how did that come about? And is there anything you learned from that experience? Yes. So it came about. I went to school for theater. And there was a professional theater company called New Art Theater that was run out of my school, which was the New Hampshire Institute of Art. And I got to meet a lot of really incredible performers. And I became good friends with one. And I was working at a little bookstore, just like part time because I was in school. And he said, I have this idea for 
a show I want to take on the road, but I need somebody A, to help book the shows and organize things, but I also need like somebody in the show. And and it just worked. And so I say magician's assistant and people think that I was like being sawed in half and stuff like that. But <laughs> yeah, but he and like pulling rabbits out of hats, but he was a mentalist or like a psychic mm-hmm. entertainer. So it was more, it was more natural. And it was like Victorian era, like seance work mm-hmm. and readings and things like that. So mm-hmm. I was that kind of assistant. Mm-hmm. Uh, I still got to wear a cool outfit. Yeah. Like, <laughs> beautiful red, like velvet cloak with feathers. So there was, it's, I basically did it for the outfit. And I think for that, I learned, and I'm like, what did I learn? I learned, um, That was the first time I learned that I could organize something creatively, organize a tour for Mm -hmm. somebody, and that's produce a show, which I didn't Mm -hmm. realize I would need these skills until like much later when I was, when I had a cabaret troupe and I was producing shows and I realized, oh my gosh, I already know how to do this stuff because I've already written press releases and I've already done these things. So strangely, I learned a lot about like show production there. No, it's really interesting. I was curious about that. Now, is there any book, talk, video, or movie that has had a really big impact on your life that you think others would benefit from as well? Oh, for me, I read so, so much, but I don't read a lot of nonfiction. I would say a book that changed my life. I'm going to go with a book called The Dog Stars. And I'm glad I'm saying this because that book is about, like, it's dystopian. There's been a terrible flu that wipes out most of the people on the planet. But the book, The Dog Stars, is first written absolutely beautifully. It's by Peter Heller. He wrote it in a, like, a poetry style. And that book taught me so much about the small, beautiful moments in life when, you know, you would think the book would be, like, depressing and terrible, And there are parts that are heartbreaking, but it's almost like a love letter to life. Oh, wow. Even though the world is, quote unquote, the world ended basically. And there's only a very few people left and not all those people are nice, but it's really, it's a love letter to life. Oh, that sounds wonderful. It's so beautiful. So I would say that book will teach you to appreciate very small moments. I'm going to put it on my list. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. Before we wrap up, I will have your website on the show notes for people to go ahead and take a look there. Is there anywhere else that you'd like people to go ahead and take a look to find out more information about you? Actually, my website, jenniferangordon.com has everything because it has all the links to my social media, my Facebook, my Instagram, my Twitter. I'm mostly active on Facebook and Instagram. Twitter, not so much. It gives me a panic attack to go there. Uh, But yeah, just go to my website. (laughs) Perfect. Before we go, I want to ask you my last question that I always just love to hear what the answer is. What are you sure of in life? Oh, wow. I'm sure that my dog loves me more than anything in the world. Like when my, I want to be the person that my dog thinks I am. So I'm sure that every day I just strive to be the version of me that my dog thinks I am. I love it. I love it. I'm right there with you. There's my dog making a little noise right now. So <laughs> I know you I'm surprised so when I just said my dog that he didn't come to the door. Cause sometimes when I'm on a podcast, I hear him like scratching at the door. What are you doing in there? <laughs> Thank you so much for this, Jennifer. It's been such a great talk. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. There is so much to learn from Jennifer's story. Jennifer held different roles in the beginning of her career, doing a variety of things, as so many of us do when we're trying to figure out what works best for us. One of those roles was a comic book store owner. For Jennifer, owning the comic book store was a struggle. There were financial concerns with a consistent fear of losing the store. It took a huge portion of her focus, leaving her little time to pursue what she wanted to be working on. And she was just plain not 
happy. I applaud Jennifer for acknowledging that she was not happy in her situation and subsequently selling the business to make a change. Too often, we stay stuck in situations that are making us unhappy because we are scared. And this is so normal. Fear of the unknown keeps you frozen in place. You worry. What if it gets worse? If this resonates with you, if you are feeling unhappy, but scared to make a change and worried it will get worse, here's what I want you to know. It's already worse. If you are unhappy, you are not where or how you are supposed to be. Bottom line, something needs to change. Life is not supposed to be unhappy. Life is not supposed to be drudgery and difficulties and only have tos. Life is supposed to be about joy, growth, learning, love, happiness. Do not settle for less. If you are unhappy, ask yourself why? Identify the pain point in your life. These will be the things that you do not want in your life. Once you have done that, you can now figure out what it is that you do want in replacement. Then create a plan to get you where you want to be. Then every day, ask yourself, what is one step I can take today to bring me closer to my happiness. Keep taking those steps. Once Jennifer let go of the comic book store, it opened up her time to focus on creating and selling her mixed media art, which is the work that filled her heart as well as her pocketbook. Let go of that which does not serve you so you can make space for that which does. While Jennifer enjoyed her artwork, it was an isolating vocation. Combining that with living in an abusive relationship, Jennifer found herself struggling mentally. She felt beaten down and stripped of her self-confidence. How many of us can relate to this feeling? I know I've been there myself. When you find yourself in those dark places, become aware that big changes are needing to be made. You must shake up your life in some positive way, and it will have to be you. You are the catalyst. You need to make the move for yourself. Find whatever it is you need to help you return back to yourself. For Jennifer, it was ballroom dancing, and I absolutely love her story about finding ballroom dancing. As she shared, Jennifer had always wanted to try it. She had a longing inside, but she was scared to do it herself. That fear made her put off this desire for years. But eventually, she got the courage to make an appointment. And Jennifer shared with us how scared and intimidating making that appointment and then going in for that first dance lesson was. I'm really grateful for her sharing because this is so normal for us to feel scared when attempting something new. The unfamiliar is always uncomfortable, but we should never allow fear to stop us from experiencing the things that we want in life. Jennifer told us that ballroom dance brought her back to where she was supposed to be, a long journey to becoming herself. Now, I want you to think about what Jennifer's life might be like had she not developed the courage to walk into that ballroom dance class. Would she have found herself again? 
Would she have left the abusive relationship? Would she have found an exciting, award-winning, and fulfilling new career? Would she have met the love of her life, her best friend and husband? Would she have had the confidence to write a book? Now, I want you to think about what your life could be like if you were to go after the secret desires you hide away. What kind of beauty could you bring into your life by learning to move forward, walking side by side with your fear instead of hiding behind it? I urge you to open that door. Do as Jennifer did and stop self-censoring yourself. There are enough outside influences that try to beat you down. You do not need to contribute. Stop telling yourself you cannot do this or you cannot do that. Put down all of those limiting beliefs and start telling yourself you can. You are capable. I am here to tell you that you can. If you've been waiting for permission, permission is granted. Go out and start learning what you want to learn, do what you want to do, experience what you want to experience. Regardless of your age or stage in life. Once Jennifer stopped telling herself she couldn't do something, she opened her life up to so much more. She stopped telling herself she could not write, and she started writing. Jennifer wrote her first book and then won the Kindle Award for Best Horror and Suspense Novel. So amazing. Would this have happened if she continued to think, well, I could never write a book. I could never win an award. I could never this. I could never that. No. Everything begins with the simple belief that yes, yes, I can. Start there. I loved Jennifer's definition of success. For her, success is always being able to create something new. When you create something, it lasts. It makes you immortal in ways that we can't even imagine. Something you create will last forever, whether it's music, a story, art, an experience, or a memory. When you create something that becomes a part of someone else's story or a part of this physical world, you leave your mark. And Jennifer has done that, not only with her writing, not only with her art and with her podcast, but also with the experiences she created for her students. Having gone through the experience herself, Jennifer knew how nervous or awkward or scared one could feel when starting a new lesson. She nurtured the relationships with her clients, getting to know them and understand them. And in turn, they learned to trust her. Jennifer is excellent at communicating and building positive relationships with others, and this is such an important skill to develop as this will help elevate every aspect of your life. Keeping good connections with people is a huge contributor to overall life success and fulfillment. I know that there are many situations in life that would feel oh so satisfying to burn a bridge in that oh so special way but I've learned through my own story and from those of others that this is a very small world and burning bridges can come back to haunt you developing and nurturing positive relationships with as many people as possible will consistently come back to enhance your life Look at what happened with Jennifer when the pandemic hit, wiping out her business and her husband's business. 
a student of hers stepped up and offered her an amazing opportunity to put her strengths to use. Now, Jennifer also shared after we stopped recording that the magician she worked for called her during the pandemic to see if she needed a job. She did not, as her student had helped her there, but this old connection ended up giving her husband a great job. All because Jennifer develops strong connections with people. How can you help grow your own relationships? How many people are around you that you haven't even attempted to develop a relationship with? You have the power to create amazing connections everywhere you go. And connections do lead to opportunity. Let's all consciously make the decision to nurture our current relationships and develop and grow new ones consistently with the people we come in contact with. We all need people. It is the people who support us throughout all of the various stages of our life. So that is my wish for us all, that we create a life full of deep and rich bonds with the amazing human souls that surround us. Until next time. Thank you for joining us on Fresh Blood. Subscribe and follow us on all streaming services, including Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Player FM. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Fresh Blood Podcast. If you liked today's episode, please consider giving us a like and sharing with a friend. I hope you make today a most fulfilling day.